Hello, uh, bonjour à tous. Uh, je m'appelle John Riley. Uh, J'habite dans l'Ouest d'Irlande et je travaille pour une entreprise uh, norvège um, qui, qui, qui s'appelle NIT. <laughs> Round of applause for John, please. <laughs> <laughs> so we agreed that if he were doing his introduction in French, I should also do it in French. <laughs> so my, uh, je m'appelle Martin, uh, j'habite à Paris, je travaille pour Apollo, uh, je fais du GraphQL, un client GraphQL qui s'appelle Apollo Kotlin. Mais aujourd'hui, uh, je vais vous parler de serveur. Ok, so back to, back to Anglais. <laughs> back to Anglais. <laughs> uh, so the plan today is that we're going to live code the development of the back-end and mobile clients for a conference application using the combination of Kotlin multi-platform, declarative UI, and GraphQL. So, pretty broad scope of technologies, and it's going to be somewhat of a whirlwind tour, but we hope at least to give folks a flavor of what these technologies are, the capabilities they provide, and what a very productive and compelling combination they are together. We'll show a couple of slides at the start, just to give some overview and context, and then we'll add some more commentary as we're building out the code. Um, so, just the usual show of hands. Um, how many people here are using Kotlin multi-platform? Okay. Half, maybe. Uh, how many people are using Compose? Um, okay, hey. quite a few. A any back-end developers? Okay. Yeah. And uh, clutching of straws here, but any iOS developers here? Hey, there's more. I, I, gave, I gave a talk at a Swift conference last year, so I asked the reverse question, and one brave soul in the corner raised his hand as an Android developer, but uh, a few more iOS developers here, anyway. Uh, so first of all, Kotlin multi-platform. At its core, it's about the ability to run Kotlin code natively on a wide range of platforms. It differs from other approaches, particularly compared to what you might call cross-platform frameworks, in that it supports optional code sharing, which in turn enables incremental adoption. It's generally focused on the sharing of non-UI code, and very importantly, it provides a mechanism in shared code of accessing native platform capabilities. Uh, there's some great guidance and documentation on the official KMM website, and very important to mention that KMM is in beta right now, but due to go stable this year. Uh, next major technology we'll be making use of today is declarative UI. Uh, Jetpack Compose and Android Swift UI on iOS. I know this is an area many people are familiar with these days, but just to level set somewhat. With declarative UI, we describe or declare what our UI should look like in a particular state. And state is very important in this context. Any changes in state cause the appropriate parts of our UI to be re-rendered or recomposed. Another interesting implication of this approach is it at least encourages use of MVVM on both platforms and typically unidirectional data flow variations of it. A uh, small bit of history, uh, Jetpack Compose was announced at Google I.O. in 2019 and went stable in 2021. SwiftUI was announced at WWDC in 2019, actually just a couple of weeks after the Compose announcement, and was released later that year. The next technology we are going to touch on in this presentation is GraphQL. So John was saying, like, uh, an introduction to declarative UI, it's, I like to think of it as a way to handle your tree of composable or UI component. And I like to think of GraphQL as doing the symmetrical thing. So it's a set of tools to help you work with your graph of data. So you have composables, you have data, you glue them together. Um, GraphQL, I like to think of it as REST with more type safety and tooling opportunities. GraphQL comes with a full type system. It has object interfaces, unions, everything you can dream of, uh, even nullability, of course, uh, just, in Kotlin, just like in Kotlin. Uh, it comes with uh, no overfetching, meaning by that that uh, the client controls what is being asked to the server, and then the server returns that data, and only that data. So you're not wasting any bytes on the network on something that is never going to be displayed in your UI. And finally, one of my favorite parts is that it is self-documenting, meaning all you need is one URL, one endpoint, and through that, you can get all the documentation, but you can also execute your, qu your queries and get all your GraphQL types and um, union interfaces, everything. This is what allows to build nice tools like this. Uh, this is graphical. So it's um, like GraphQL, but with an I in the middle. Uh, we're going to reuse that through the presentation. I like to think of it as an ID uh, because it allows you to type your query in the left pane and with autocomplete everything. Not completely like IntelliJ Android Studio, but it's getting there. And then you have uh, your response on the right pane directly in your browser. And of course, GraphQL loves Kotlin, and Kotlin loves GraphQL. It's a love story. Uh, there are a lot of tools in the ecosystem to work with GraphQL. Today, we are going to use two. First one is GraphQL Kotlin. It's a library built by Expedia. It lives on the server, and it takes your Kotlin code 
and translate that to GraphQL types and fields. And the way it works is using a lot of reflection at runtime, so don't go away. Uh, it's pretty cool though because uh, it's completely automatic, you just have to write Kotlin and it gets translated to GraphQL. Second library which we are going to use is Apollo Kotlin, so it lives on the client side of things, uh, it does the opposite, so you write GraphQL and it generates type safe Kotlin models from it, meaning you are guaranteed that every field you touch in your UI has an expected type, uh, including nullability, so you don't have to do all kinds of self calls and everything, parsing in your UI models and everything. It has in-memory and persistent caches, and most importantly, it is multi-platform, uh, which is what allows us to share a lot of code between the beautiful Android and iOS that John is going to build. And this is what we're planning on developing today, along with associated backend, uh, basic Android and iOS apps that display a list of sessions for a particular conference in Android makers in this case. The full application has broader functionality, includes uh, Wear OS, that Compose for Desktop, and even more recently, Android Auto. Uh, hopefully folks were at Carlos Mota's talk earlier, really nice talk, and got to see that in action. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about more of that at the end. Uh, this is the repo the talk is based on. If folks are interested in trying it out, and even better contributing, and a big shout out to the folks that have contributed so far. So this is a high-level architecture diagram for what we're trying to build. We have the GraphQL backend, shared Kotlin multi-platform code that includes a repository interacting with that backend using the Apollo library, shared view model, and iOS and Android composed clients. And we'll talk more about these, of course, as we're building out the code. I'm going to hand over to Marta now to build the backend. So let's go build some server. So full disclaimer, I, as I told you, uh, I'm not a backend engineer. Like I do mostly Android and clients. But my goal today is to show you that even if you're not a backend engineer, so like uh, I think 95% of you here, uh, you can still write a backend quite easily using GraphQL, Kotlin, and Kator. So this is my goal today. Uh, if you have never used Kator, you can go to the website, which is somewhere here. Where is Safari? Or Chrome? Oh. Is it over? Yeah, it's here. No, what, that's what, what, studio. <laughs> we, we knew we had something that needed to go wrong. Uh, okay, okay. It, it's gone. <laughs> so you can go to the Kator start site. So Kator has a lot of nice documentation. It especially has this web page here where you can go to advanced project setting, you give it your favorite uh, choices, your language of choices, favorite engine, and it's going to generate a sample project for you. So if you have never built a Kator project before, this is a great place to start. Uh, I did that. Uh, of course, I chose Gradle Kotlin as my favorite language for my build script, and I chose Nelly as an engine because it's very stable. It's a framework to build a web application for Java and the GVM and, of course, Kotlin. That has been there for a very long time and is very solid. Because I'm a beginner, I feel more confident that way. And I created a small project, so it's just a bunch of files, really. A couple of files uh, that we are going to fill together. Um, yeah, a Gradle file. Uh, I can go there. Actually, they all fit in my tabs so that I can switch easily. There's an application file, a uh, model file, and let's start with the Gradle file, which was not in the tabs yet, but I can add it. So I started with a very simple project, Kotlin GVM. It has the Kotlin plugin, serialization plugin, and Kotlin x.datetime, which we are going to need. These are pretty standard stuff, so I won't uh, go too much into details there. First thing we are going to do is cheat a little bit. Uh, use live templates. So I'm going to do that through this presentation, um, mainly because it, it's faster, we, we don't have a lot of time. Also because I'm typing on a weird keyboard <laughs> called QWERTY. <I> <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm one of these people uh, still typing on AZERTY. I, I like it better. I can put accent in my email and this kind of stuff. <laughs> uh, but anyways, uh, the Kator plugin uh, does a bunch of things. Uh, mainly it's going to create jar files for you, complete fat jar files containing all the dependencies that you can upload in your favorite cloud provider, so maybe GCP, maybe something else. 
And it's also going to create a Gradle task called run fat jar that we are going to use to start a server locally. I'm going to hit synth here to have autocomplete everything. I'm going to add a few dependencies. So two dependencies here. First one is Ktor Nati, which is Ktor using the Nati engine as a backend, and GraphQL Kotlin from Expedia, which is the actual library that takes your GraphQL queries, parses them, executes them, and returns a JSON response. I need to do one last thing, which is telling anyone wanting to run the application and the jar file where to start. And this is done by uh, using the application plugin. It's actually applied by the Kator plugin under the, under the hood. So this is why we have the Gradle DSL there. Uh, the important thing here is we are going to start an application called application KT or original. Let's go to application KT. And since we are going to write GraphQL, I'm going to start writing GraphQL. Oh, I need to hit sync here. Don't like red too much. Yay. I'm going to do it now because <laughs> I want to be sure I get it. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so it's three lines, really, but this is everything that's needed, actually, from the point of view of GraphQL to generate your GraphQL backend. You write a Kotlin class. Here it's root query. Because it's the root query, I make it extend from a, a query, which is a GraphQL Kotlin class. And GraphQL Kotlin will, at runtime, uh, in introspect, look at this class, see that it has a function called hello, and generate a matching GraphQL field for that. I can actually tweak things a little bit and say hello, Android makers. Of course, I need a bit more configuration. I need to configure Kator. So if uh, there are Kator fans in, in there, like you are certainly familiar with this, I'm installing a GraphQL module here, telling GraphQL Kotlin to only scan at runtime a given package. We don't want to scan everything because it's going to make everything slower. We don't want that and telling the main entry point for the root query. I need to configure the routing as well. And um, I'm going to configure a GraphQL post route here, which is the main route where I will receive the request, and the GraphQL route, which is the route where the graphical ID will be displayed. So I, can, um, I don't need to synchronize, actually. I can just go to my command line and start my server. Be ready for the confettis. <laughs> <laughs> All right, what did I, did I, what did I forget? Uh, yes, um, I, need, I, I can show the error again. So it says something, please define the static main function. Uh, this is because I was saying application KT here, but didn't define a, a main function here, so I'm going to cheat a little bit and actually start the server. This sounds like something I need to do. On port 8080 here, configuring, and I'm waiting because I want to start the server forever. Let's try again. Yay! Definitely deserves, deserves a confetti. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's not very, uh, very demonstrative, <laughs> but uh, it's working. If I go to localhost here, trust me, you, you don't have to trust me, actually. I can show it. Uh, so if I were to send a request, I would just use GraphQL here. But if I, if I want the ID, I can just add an I in the middle. And I'm greeted with this graphical ID, which means it actually did work. I can browse the documentation here, see all the fields. Currently, there is only one. And if I start typing, I have autocomplete. And I can execute my query. And it works. Yeah. It's another one. <laughs> OK, I, I'm finished with this. Okay, <laughs> um, It's good. Uh, there's actually a lot of stuff going on there. We don't have to write any JSON parser, anything like this, any HTTP handling. It's all handled by GraphQL Kotlin. But we want more data like, in order to display the, the Android Maker data and show the iOS and Android apps. We need actual conference data. So for this, I cheated a little bit and created a JSON file with all the conference data for Android makers. It's a very typical model, what you would expect from a conference. Contains title, description, start, end time, and a list of speakers for each session in the conference. 
We are going to pass that with Kotlin X dot serialization. So I'm going to go quickly here because it's really a lot of very standard code. Defining models for all the JSON models. A top level data class. Oh, I went a bit too fast here. Yay. And I'm using Kotlin X dot serialization to decode everything. It's very easy, actually. The main entry point for Kotlin X dot serialization is the JSON class here. I mean, top level object, actually. And it's as easy as loading the resource from the jar file. So I'm going to embed the JSON in the jar file and calling decode from stream on it. Then I get a JSON data property here that I can use in my application. And here I'm going to replace the hello thing. I'm going to say now it should return a list of sessions. I don't even need to do this, but it's easier to understand. And let's make it return the list of sessions. If I want to convey more information about this, I can also include documentation directly inside the code, so it all stays in the single source of truth. And I can say something like everything happening at Android makers. This will be useful later, hopefully. All right, uh, let's try to rerun our server. Go there, refresh the server. Oh, I went a bit too fast. Oh. Should be good. Uh, let's see. Yeah, I don't know what's happening. It's good. <laughs> uh, ID, I can just remove the error to make it look better, <laughs> like this. Title, description. I'm go also going to ask for the start time and also what the, the speakers. So if I hit play, yeah, this is much better. So I get the actual full data for Android makers. Uh, if you remember, there was this nice session from two people called Romain and Chet yesterday. Well, wait, we don't see Romain and Chet here. So. Uh, it would be nice if instead of having uh, speaker IDs here, we would, have, we would be able to do what GraphQL is really good at, which is drilling inside your graph of data. So it would be nice to have something like this. So let's do this. Going back to our model and going back to session, I can just add GraphQL fields by adding Kotlin functions. So I need, remember, I need a, a speakers field here. So I'm just going to do that and type a speakers function. It's going to return a list of speakers. And I'm going to get them from the JSON data. Yeah, just use this filter, just a regular Kotlin code to do this. Um, since now I have a list of speakers, I can remove the list of IDs here because it's quite useful. It pollutes the namespace. For this, I can just put pre private on front of the property, and GraphQL Kotlin will understand that it's a private property, and it doesn't need to be exposed in GraphQL. I'm going to do the same for room. It's going to be used later. And there. All right. I rerun everything. So I'm going to do this. Yay! It's not red anymore. Hitting play, I can now see chat and Roma. So it's good. It's a, it's a good data. There is one last thing I want to show before uh, handing the mic back to John for building the actual apps, which we, you are all here to watch. Um, it's you know how I always say the GraphQL type system is very similar to the Kotlin type system. There's nullability, everything. What if you have a type in, in Kotlin that you want to expose in GraphQL, but it's not there in GraphQL already? Well, turns out you can do this. Uh, if I take an example, there is something in the session here called start. It's a string. It's not very helpful. Like, if I'm a client, how do I read this string? Would be nice to make it a better type. So I'm just going to do this quickly. And for this, I'm going to copy-paste a lot of code. So bear with me. So it's first two blocks here are telling GraphQL Kotlin that every time it sees a Kotlin X local dead time, it should translate it to a local dead time GraphQL type. And this is what's happening here. In the middle, it's just like parsing and uh, encoding again. 
And uh, this is here where we create the new Scala. We need to use it in our configuration here. Something like this. All right, and inside our models, I can define functions like, just like I did with everything else and make everything private. All right. Run everything. And if I hit play, no, nothing should change actually, except the documentation. Uh, if I reload the schema here, going here, going to session. Yeah, the start time is now a local date time, which is good. You can define and augment your GraphQL schema. So that was it for me. Hopefully that gave uh, all the Android developers in the room like a, a raw idea of where to start if you want to build your own backend. It's not as bad as it looks. And now I'm leaving the mic back to John to code the actual uh, Android and iOS apps. Okay, so as Martin said, let's, uh, let's build the mobile clients. So we're starting off with somewhat of a pre-prepared project, more or less as if generated using the KMM, the Kotlin Multiplatform Mobile Plugin, with some Gradle dependencies added. As shown earlier, this is a high-level architecture diagram for what we're building. Martin has already built the GraphQL backend, and I'm going to focus now on the Kotlin Multiplatform shared code and the Android and iOS clients. We're going to create a, a basic repository that uses GraphQL to interact with the backend, a shared view model that exposes observable UI states to the client, and then compose and switch UI code to create the UI. Uh, the tabs shown at the top are basically all the files we'll be interacting with. So as Martin mentioned, uh, Apollo generates Kotlin code from the combination of your GraphQL queries and the backend schema. And to do that, it needs the two files shown here. So, so firstly, the queries. So this is similar to what Martin showed earlier, but we're also making use of a GraphQL fragment here just as a convenience, as this then get mapped, gets mapped then directly to a Kotlin data class, which we'll be making use of shortly. As an initial sanity test, we can run a query directly from the IDE and just confirm we're getting the data back from the back end. The other file we need then is the schema file. And we can use an Apollo Gradle task to pull that from the server. And then we can run another Apollo Gradle task to actually generate the Kotlin source code. Now, this would normally get executed uh, automatically as part of a build, but just running it at this point, just to give an opportunity to look at some of the generated code. And here we see, for example, the Kotlin data class that was um, created from that fragment I mentioned earlier. Okay, so let's uh, build out our repository. And this is going to encapsulate our use of Apollo to interact with the back end. I'm going to firstly add in the conference name. And then we're going to create the Apollo object, which we're going to use to make our queries with to the back end. Uh, this is connecting to the local instance that Martin has running, and is also using the, uh, the cache that he mentioned, both the persistent and the in-memory one as well. And lastly, we, asked, we add something to expose the list of sessions from the repository. This is using the query code that was generated automatically earlier, and I was also using a nice Apollo Watch API to observe the data in the cache, and expose as a Kotlin flow. So we also have a JVM target uh, in the project. I'm going to use this just to pull in a small main function, just as an additional sort of sanity test at this point to confirm that everything is wired up correctly. Having a JVM target is also uh, gives us the opportunity to create a Compose for Desktop client, which is something we have in the GitHub repository as well. So if we run this, we should hopefully see. Yay, so we're getting the data back from our repository, and we can see, this, for example, those initial talks, et cetera, uh, confirming that our repository is wired up correctly. Uh, next up, we're going to create our shared view model, uh, which we're going to expose observable state to the clients. So the, the, the state in this case is going to include our conference name, the list of conference dates, and the list of sessions uh, restructured in a way that's easier to consume um, in the clients. So the actual uh, view model itself. Um, in, the, in the GitHub repo, we're using coin to inject the repository, but just for easier illustration here, we're, we're uh, constructing the repository directly here. Also, you're making use of a nice KMM view model library, which will allow us, as we'll see in a moment, to expose the state from here, uh, make it directly observable in our SwiftUI code. 
And then the code to, to create the UI states. There's a lot to unpack here, but basically all we're doing here is just restructuring that list of sessions by date and time as mentioned, so it can be more easily consumed. And we're also um, converting the flow to, a, to using state in to a, a state flow. Okay, next up, the compose code. Okay, we can generally think of our uh, composable functions as a tree of UI components, and as such, we're gonna start at the leaf node and, and work our way up. So this is session view. This is representing a row in our list of sessions. Uh, it's using the session details class that we showed earlier in our shared code. It's using standard column and text, for example, from, from, um, from Compose and just rendering that information. If we move up to uh, the list, um, this is just using standard Compose lazy column to display a flat list of sessions. Just for convenience, initially, we're going to display the list of sessions for the first day, and we'll update this shortly. Then we have something representing our overall screen. And this is where we use the view model from our shared code and observe the, the state from there. Any changes to which then will cause our UI to be re-rendered. So for example, uh, in the loading state, we'll show a ind progress indicator. And then obviously, when we get the, the data back, we show the full list. And finally, we have our top level uh, activity. So if we run this, Are you doing the confetti thing? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have this. Oh, actually, I'm going to do a clean build here. Sorry. Uh, okay. It's another kind of celebration. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, if this, builds, if this does, I'll definitely do it. <laughs> okay. Bear with me. Yay. Yay. I'm definitely doing the confetti after that. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> so this is a pretty boring flat list of sessions that uh, we're going to show initially. But let's show something that better represents the structure of our data. Um, so if I, for example, if I pull in, I uh, use uh, Compose, if I can select correctly here. Okay. If we pull in uh, Compose Scaffold, um, this allows us to sort of pull in an, a top app bar. We're using Material 3, by the way, using this nice central line top app bar. And we see, for example, we're using the conference name coming from our UI state. So if we run this again, looking a little bit better. We have the title there now. Um, but we're going to show a horizontal pager. And to do that, and, and, and a tab row, so we're going to make use of some pager states, which will allow us to hook those together. Then we add in the tab row itself. This is sort of wrapper around the standard Compose tab row. We're using that pager state, and we're using the UI state containing the list of conference names, for example. And then finally, if we add in our uh, horizontal pager, OK. And now that we have that, we can actually, instead of just showing the data for the, set, the first date, we can show the data for the correct date using the page variable coming from the horizontal pager. And if we run this again. OK, we're getting something that more closely represents our data. We have the tabs now, and we can, we can flip between those. OK, and one more, one more change here in this, in this section. We're just going to add something showing the, uh, the time. OK, and we have the sessions now broken down by time, uh, look, looking a little bit better. OK, let's, let's make similar changes now in our Xcode in our iOS client. OK, we are um, going to, the Swift UI uh, elements here are going to pretty much close, very closely match to the composed ones. For example, so if we add in session view, this is almost, this is very similar as you could probably see from the composed one we have. We're using Swift UI vStack versus compose uh, column, for example, but we're using the same session information that we got from our shared code, the same session details. We're using even the same session speaker info extension function in our shared code that we used in compose. So let's work our way up again. We add something representing the, uh, the list. And again, for now, we're just going to show the data for the first day, and we'll update that shortly. We have something representing our screen as a whole. And again, in a very similar way, we're interacting with the view model from our shared code, and we're observing that same UI state. Again, using the KMM view model, that state is observable in the same way in our Swift UI code as it is in our Compose code. And then we add something a top level uh, content view. Let me run this. And while that's running, I'm just going to take the opportunity to uh, 
mentioned a small bit about how this is all hooked up together. Uh, when you use the KMM view model, it, when it, what it generates, it adds a, a run script to your Xcode project, which basically just delegates out to, to Gradle uh, to build the shared code as a, as a framework, which is then uh, pulled in and available. Okay, so we have, um, very similar to how we started in Compose, we have our flat list of sessions. And again, very sim in a very similar way, we're going to, um, it, we're going to replace, we're going to show the completed version. I won't go into the same detail as we went to in, in the Compose code. Um, Okay, so this, um, details aren't too important here. We're using, for example, Picker instead of the Tabro we used in Compose. We're navigating through the data in the same way. And if we run this. Okay, and again, we see very, something very similar to our Compose code. We have the tabs that we, and we have the data mapped, uh, shown grouped by date, for example. So if we go back to Compose code, uh, one very important piece of information we're missing here, as people might have noticed, is the room name. Okay, so I'm going to make an update to the query to bring that in. Okay, and uh, if I switch over to the generated code now, you can see the room name here. And this is using a, a very nice plugin uh, that Benoit Lubeck from the Apollo team. Happy birthday, Benoit, by the way. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, very nice plugin he wrote, which basically, um, as soon any changes that you make to the query are cause the uh, code to be regenerated automatically. It's a very, very nice feature. So having that added in there, we can now go into our um, our UI code and update to, put, to pull that in. And if we run this. Okay, and we can see hopefully the room name coming in there as well. And we'll make, a very, we'll make the exact same change in our iOS client as well. Um, I'm just gonna kick off a build here because uh, I want to just rebuild the uh, shared code as a framework so that it gets pulled into Xcode and we get the, we get the code completion of, uh, available to us here as well. Okay. And in, in the same way, and again, hopefully you can see the similarity in the, you know, Another very interesting aspect that hopefully that peeps, people notice is the similarity between the Swift UI and the Compose code. So in an almost identical code that we added in Compose, we're going to add in uh, Swift UI as well. And if we run that, and we get the, the, the session name as well, okay, which is quite nice. So one thing I uh, just want to mention briefly is uh, this is published to the App Store. Um, and it has an iPad client, and one of the nice things about that then is that it's available to run directly as a Mac OS app on your um, on Apple Silicon tablets. So if I hopefully if I can go over to Confetti here, so this is an example here of our if you download if the iPad or app on your Mac OS, uh, you get this application here. It's built using the same Swift UI and it's built using the same Kotlin multi-platform shared code as our other clients. Okay, um, just going to finish up with one just a demonstration, one more thing here. There's always one more thing, isn't there? <laughs> um, if I can open up the right, if I can, right IDE. Uh, Looking for the yes. emulator. Yeah, the select device. Uh, where was round? Okay. Um, hopefully, we this. That was one thing, isn't there? Fun with emulators. Yes. Um, so this is, uh, yay, okay. So this is a Wear OS app that Yuri Shimka contributed to the Confetti repository, a very nice one. You can browse by, com by conference. You can go into uh, browse by sessions, obviously, uh, look at particular speakers, for example. Um, you can log in, view your bookmarks. It runs in standalone mode or, or, or paired. And if it's paired, for example, it syncs the conference name that you selected from the Android app. And even syncs team information as well. It has uh, sort of complications, support, uh, and a number of other features. Very nice. Definitely recommend trying it out. Um, okay, I'm going to hand over to Martin to wrap up. To wrap up, let's go. So hopefully we gave a pretty good overview of everything that's possible to do with Kotlin today. Wait, where are we? Here. Yeah, back to this diagram. 
So we actually have wrote everything by cheating a little bit, but we wrote everything in this diagram from the back end. Like you can share your, uh, not the back end, you, can, you, you don't share in the back end. Actually, you can if you want to. <laughs> but you can write Kotlin and have GraphQL Kotlin generate GraphQL for you. You can share in the middle section here. So you can share a lot of things. Uh, really, this is uh, maybe the takeaway of this talk is that using Kotlin, you can share a lot of things between your iOS apps, Android apps, and the back, and the back end, the, the Kotlin server. Here we're sharing the networking and caching layer with Apollo. We're also sharing all the business logic with KMM view model, uh, which is a nice library that exposes bindings to Swift and uh, bindings to Jetpack Compose in, in view models. And obviously, you can write native UI that respects the look and feel of each platform in Jetpack Compose on Android, and this is a tiny bit without Kotlin, but in, with Swift UI on iOS. But it's a way, this way you have all the native look and feel. This was very quick because we didn't have much time. Uh, it actually took a tiny bit more time to build the full project, <laughs> a tiny bit more than 40 minutes. Uh, there's a full project behind that. We, we actually started this project because we, we are both uh, huge Kotlin fans, and we wanted to try Kotlin everywhere it was possible to run Kotlin. But the project has evolved a lot. It's available today in your favorite app store. You can download it, actually. If you like it, give us five stars. If you hate it, give us uh, feedback. <laughs> and uh, in all cases, help us build it. The app is 100% open source. Uh, John is making a super job at, at welcoming new contributors. Like, we have new contributors every week or so. Mm -hmm. um, when we started this slide, actually, it was mid-March, something like that, in preparation of Kotlin Conf. And it was already quite packed with information. And then uh, Yuri added Wear OS support. Uh, we, we have uh, like a new iOS screen search. What else? I'm for forgetting some stuff, but uh, the, the, the slides <laughs> began to grow. Yeah. Uh, last week, uh, we added uh, Android Auto. Uh, thanks to Carlos here. Congrats, Carlos. <laughs> um, if you made it, made it to his presentation, you, kn you know everything about Android Auto. And uh, really, this app is a good opportunity to try out the latest te Kotlin technology, Android technology, on something that doesn't get you fired if you mess up. <laughs> and we do, uh, trust us. Um, so, conclusion here, and maybe I can switch to the last slide. There is one platform that we didn't mention in this slide, which is the web. We'd love to do something there, like we have desktop, we have Wear OS, we have auto, we have uh, iOS, obviously. Uh, not uh, not Compose, iOS, not Compose Apple Watches desktop. yet. Did you say Compose for Desktop? Which one? Compose for Desktop. Compose for Desktop, yeah. yes. Uh, so we are missing uh, iOS watches yeah. and web. web. So if you know how to do anything about this, or if you actually want to add more data, like you work on, want to work with data, you want to add your own conference, uh, please reach out. Uh, we'll be around. With that, we want to thank you for listening, and I think we have a few minutes for questions.